the poet by Mark Akenside of all the various lots around the ball, which fate to man distributes, absolute. Avert, ye gods. That of the muse's son, cursed with dire poverty. Poor hungry wretch. What shall he do for life? He cannot work with manual labor. Shall those sacred hands, that brought the counsels of the gods to light, shall that inspired tongue, which every muse has touched divine, to charm the sons of men, these hallowed organs, these, be prostitute to the vile service of some fool in power, all his behests submissive to perform, howe'er to him ingrateful? Oh, he scorns the ignoble thought, with generous disdain, more eligible deeming it to starve, like his famed ancestors renowned in verse, than poorly bend to be another's slave, than feed and fatten in obscurity. These are his firm resolves, which fate, nor time, nor poverty can shake. Exalted high in garret vile he lives, with remnants hung of tapestry. But oh, precarious state of this vain transient world, all-powerful time, what dost thou not subdue? See what a chasm gapes wide, tremendous. See where Saul, enraged, high on his throne, encompassed by his guards, with leveled spear, and arm extended, sits, ready to pierce old Jess's valiant son, spoiled of his nose. Around in tottering ranks, on shelves pulverulent, majestic stands his library, in ragged plight, and old, replete with many a load of criticism, elaborate products of the midnight toil of Belgian brains, snatched from the deadly hands of murderous grocer, or the careful white, who vends the plant, that clads the happy shore of Indian Potomac, which citizens in balmy fumes exhale, when, or a pot of sage-inspiring coffee, they dispose of kings and crowns, and settle Europe's fate. Elsewhere the dome is filled with various heaps of old domestic lumber. That huge chair has seen six monarchs fill the British throne. Here a broad massy table stands, o'erspread with ink and pens, and scrolls replete with rhyme, chests, stools, old razors, fractured jars, half full of muddy zythum, sour and spiritless, fragments of verse, hose, sandals, utensils of various fashion, and of various use, with friendly influence hide the sable floor. This is the Bard's Museum, this the fane to PHS bus sacred, and the Aeonian maids, but oh, it stabs his heart, that niggard fate to him in such small measure should dispense her better gifts, to him whose generous soul could relish, with his fine and elegance, the golden joys of grandeur, and of wealth. He who could tyrannize o'er menial slaves, or swell beneath a coronet of state, or grace a gilded chariot with a mien, grand as the haughtiest timon of them all. But tis in vain to rave at destiny, here he must rest, and brook the best he can, to live remote from grandeur, learning, wit, immured amongst th, ignoble, vulgar herd, of lowest intellect, whose stupid souls but half inform their bodies, brains of lead and tongues of thunder, whose insensate breasts ne'er felt the rapturous, soul-entrancing fire of the celestial muse, whose savage ears ne'er heard the sacred rules, nor even the names of the Venusian bard, or critic sage full-famed of stagira, whose clamorous tongues stun the tormented ear with colloquy, vociferate, trivial, or impertinent, replete with boorish scandal, yet, alas, this, this, he must endure, or muse alone, pensive and moping o'er the stubborn rhyme, or line imperfect no. The door is free, and calls him to evade their deafening clang, by private ambulation. Tis resolved. Off from his waist he throws the tattered gown, beheld with indignation, and unloads his pericranium of the weighty cap, with sweat and grease discolored, then explores the spacious chest, and from its hollow womb draws his best robe, yet not from tincture free of ages. Reverend Russet, scant and bare, then down his meager visage waving flows the shadowy peruke, crowned with gummy hat, clean brushed, a cane supports him. Thus equipped he sallies forth, swift traverses the streets, and seeks the lonely walk. Hail sylvan scenes, ye groves, ye valleys, ye meandering brooks, Admit me to your joys, in rapturous phrase, loud he exclaims, while with the inspiring muse his bosom labors, and all other thoughts, pleasure and wealth, and poverty itself, before her influence vanish. Wrapped in thought, 
fancy presents before his ravished eyes distant posterity, upon his page with transport dwelling. While bright learning sons, that ages hence must tread this earthly ball, indignant, seem to curse the thankless age, that starved. Such merit. Meantime, swallowed up in meditation deep, he wanders on, unweeding of his way. But ah! He starts, with sudden fright, his glaring eyeballs roll, pale turn his cheeks, and shake his loosened joints, his cogitations vanish into air, like painted bubbles, or a morning dream. Behold the cause. See, through the opening glade, with rosy visage, and abdomen grand, a CIT. A dun, as in Apulia's wilds, or where the Thracian Hebrus rolls his wave, a heedless kid, disportive, roves around, unheeding, till upon the hideous cave of the dire wolf she treads. Half dead she views his bloodshot eyeballs, and his dreadful fangs, and swift as Eurus from the monster flies. So fares the trembling bard. Amazed he turns, scarce by his legs upburn. Yet fear supplies the place of strength. Straight home he bends his course, nor looks behind him till he safe regain his faithful citadel. There spent, fatigued, he lays him down to ease his heaving lungs, quaking, and of his safety scarce convinct. Soon as the panic leaves his panting breast, down to the muse's sacred rites he sits, volumes pilled round him. See, upon his brow perplexed, anxiety, and struggling thought, painful as female throes, whether the bard display the deeds of heroes, or the fall of vice, in lay dramatic, or expand the lyric wing, or in elegiac strains lament the fair, or lash the stubborn age with laughing satire, or in rural scenes with shepherd sport, or rack his hard-bound brains for the unexpected turn. Arachne so, in dusty kitchen. Corner, from her bowels spins the fine web, but spins with better fate, than the poor bard, she. Caitiff, spreads her snares, and with their aid enjoys luxurious life, bloated with fat of insects, fleshed in blood, he. Hard, hard lot, for all his toil and care, and painful watchings, scarce protracts a while his meager, hungry days. Ungrateful world, if with his drama he adorn the stage, no worth discerning concourse pays the charge, or of the orchestra, or the enlightening torch. He who supports the luxury and pride of craving lawyers, he whose carnage fills dogs, eagles, lions, has not yet enough, wherewith to satisfy the greedier maw of that most ravenous, that devouring beast, eclept a poet. What new Halifax, what summers, or what Dorset canst thou find, thou hungry mortal? Break, wretch, break thy quill, blot out the studied image, to the flames commit the stage I write. Leave this thankless trade. Erect some peddling stall, with trinkets stocked, there earn thy daily halfpence, nor again trust the false muse. So shall the cleanly meal repel intruding hunger. Oh, tis vain, the friendly admonitions all in vain. The scribbling itch has seized him. He is lost to all advice, and starves for starving sake. Thus sung the sportful muse, in mirthful mood indulging gay the frolic vein of youth, but, oh, ye gods, avert th, impending stroke this luckless omen threatens. Hark, methinks I hear my better angel cry, retreat, rash youth. In time retreat, let those poor bards, who slighted all, all, for the flattering muse, yet cursed with pining want, as landmarks stand, to warn thee from the service of the ingrate.